Good morning, my name is Caden Carlin, and I worked over the, as the source reduction assistant intern at Spirit Air Systems. Um, some of the company background for Spirit, um, Spirit's main facility is headquartered in Wichita, Kansas, and they're one of the world's largest manufacturers of aerospace structures for um, commercial, private, and defense programs, manufacture fuselages, um, pylons, wing components, nacelles, kinds of stuff. Um, currently, they have about 16,100 employees worldwide, and the facility in Wichita, Kansas is located in an environmental justice area, and that means that over 50% of the surrounding population is considered low income, and also over 50% of the surrounding population is also a minority. And this project just helps to address the Spirit's mission of equal and fair treatment of individuals regardless of status. So these are the four project goals that Nancy was talking about. The first one was to establish an internal advisory board. And this was accomplished last year by the 2021 intern. And then the board met wrote most recently on July 18th to revisit our solvent reduction efforts, as well as to um, receive their input on the projects we're working on. And then the second goal was to reduce hazardous material and emissions by 10% for airplane built. And we do that through the third goal, which is investigating and studying high solvent use areas and practices to find opportunities to reduce solvent usage and solvent waste as well. And the two target solvents that this grant was looking at was Boeing material spec or BMS 11.7 and methylpropyl ketone or MPK. And then we also found additional opportunities for isopropyl alcohol or IPA, naphtha, and then an IPA 50-50 mixture of IPA and water. And then we also worked on establishing training videos and case studies for these projects as well. Some more project background. This is year two of a 30-month project that is funded by the source reduction grant that the EPA manages. Um, specifically, what I was looking at this year was actually the solvent hand wipe cleaning process. Um, what happens is um, operators use this process to clean like any contamination that's um, present on the fuselage. Okay. So the solvent comes in like a 16 ounce bottle that operators are free to get as much as they want. And um, so that's what I've been looking at this summer. Um, and specifically, I've been looking at plant two. Plant two. The Wichita location is the highest user of the solvent in the hand wipe cleaning process. And in 2019, 2019 is like the baseline we've been using for the solvent reduction. Um, in 2019, they consumed 35,695 gallons of solvent in just the hand wipe cleaning process. And it's important to note that um, the solutions we've developed can be implemented, can be implemented across all of Spirit's facilities in both the Wichita area and eventually the global scale as well. And this graph right here kind of shows how solvent usage correlates with um, the production rates. Production rates, I'm not allowed to say what it's for, but it's for like the main product that comes out of plant two, and you can see how closely they relate to each other. And then this is just some more background on what the solvent hand wipe process is used for. It's used in the riveting before they join the parts together to clean contamination from fuselage or other um, equipment. It's also used before they apply like paint and primer and sealant as well. And it just helps to maintain a high quality of standard that Spirit has to abide by. And then it's also used in the touch-up processes as well, just to remove any additional contamination that would be remaining on the fuselage. For some reason, this photo isn't showing all the way, but it shows um, the master mix machine. Um, so this is um, the part of the process after um, the solvent bottles get used and they get returned to this area here and they get refilled so that they can be reused out on the floor. And this machine is responsible for refilling those bottles. And unfortunately you can't see it all, but um, machine is old and it's producing lots of overflow solvent. Um, last year, um, the 2021 intern worked on and recommended a new replacement for this machine 
and it's currently in the capital approval process. And it's a long and deliberate process. And while we're waiting on that, um, one of the other solutions we were looking at is actually ordering new solvent bottles that have a larger opening. Um, the current solvent bottles have a 2.1 centimeter, 2.1 centimeter diameter opening. So it's not very big at all. And over the course of a 50, six day period, it was producing 50 gallons of overflow solvent. And that was measured last year. Um, so the one of the solutions we were looking at is getting a bottle with larger opening. And these are some of the numbers that um, we were able to come up with using the 2019 baseline. It's producing an estimated 11 tons of VOCs. And all of these, I forgot to mention, all of these chemicals are VOCs in BMS 11.7. Isopropyl alcohol in the MPK are also HAPS. Um, 2.7 tons of HAPS were being produced, about 3,000 gallons of hazardous waste, and it's costing $50,000 when you use a typical production year. And this is excluding the flushing events. The flushing events refer to the line flushing that they do whenever they refill the bottles with a different chemical. Um, unfortunately, um, the manufacturer was having issues getting sample bottles, and he's look, he's currently looking for other bottles that we can use with the larger open, and then we'd be able to test those and measure overflow reduction, and then um, use that overflow reduction to measure um, VOCs reduction, HAPS reductions, and other stuff like that. So the next part of um, the process that I was looking at in the solvent hand wipe cleaning process was um, the disposal process. So after operators use the solvent out on the floor, um, what we found is that most of the bottles, not most of them, but a lot of the bottles we saw had like solvent remaining in them. And you can see in this photo, in this graphic, how much solvent was, that red, that red line indicates how much solvent was remaining in that bottle. But um, due to various reasons, these bottles are being returned with solvent remaining in them. Um, one of them, one of the uh, reasons we identified was that the signs that are used in solvent storage areas are too wordy and they're kind of hard to follow for employees to be able to determine where they should put their empty bottles and then the full slash partially full bottles that, they're, that can still be used. Um, one of the other reasons that these are getting returned is that at the shift due to um, just laziness. Um, employees are rushing through their cleanup processes and they just want to do stuff as quick as they can. They want to get out of there. So we just want to make it easier um, for them to do so, but we also make sure they're putting the bottles in the right locations too. And it's also causing labor. Um, Suing labor costs because the um, operator that's in charge of going around and collect all the empty bottles after they get used, um, he's spending about one to two hours every day just of the solvent and then reorganizing the bottles into their proper totes. So this slide, a couple more photos of what um, the messy flammable cabinet um, looked like and then what the ideal cabinet looked like basically cabinet on the left in this photo, which you can't see, um, it had like a bunch of totes stacked on top of each other. And the flam cabinets are where we're supposed to store the full slash partially full bottles, because when they get left out, it's actually a fire safety issue. And pushing it through is both a fire safety issue and an environmental safety issue as well. Um, and when those totes are stacked on top of each other, it makes it more difficult for the employees to return um, the bottles and because when the totes when the totes are stacked on top of each other, they're not they're not sure where the chemicals are supposed to go. So getting more shelving would be one way we could reduce the solvent waste and make it easier and more accessible for employees to be able to return their bottles efficiently and effectively. And some of these are the solutions we've been brainstorming. Um, we've been working with Spirit's PR team on like an employee outreach um, slash awareness campaign. And I think the name we're currently calling it is the Spirit of Conservation. 
Um, some of the practical solutions we're working at, we are looking at is the shelving for the cats for the flammable cabinets so that the um, the chemicals can actually be separated properly. And then we also want to remove the totes from the cabinets as well. That's something that the last slide did was an, unable to show. Um, we also want to look at new bottle labels for um, MPK bottles. Um, MPK and BMS 11.7 currently have, they both are pink. And when they start fading over time, it's difficult for employees to be able to tell which is which. And that's just one of the things we can do to make it easier on them by changing the label and making it easier to identify which, which chemical is which. And then after we change that label, we want to color code the label of the chemical to um, the sign where it should be stored so that it would be a better system of just looking at the color of the chemical and being able to tell where it's supposed to go. Um, and then we also want to reorganize the solvent storage areas. We want to um, make the flammable cabinets more accessible to the employees by making it closer to the entrance. We want to make it easier to return the, the full slash partially full bottles to the flam cabinets instead of the empty bottles. Because currently, at least in the areas we've been looking at, the empty bottles are easier to return than the full slash partially full bottles. And then the employee outreach solutions, like we, I mentioned earlier, we've been looking at replacing the signs that they have, reducing the amount of words they have, and setting up a nice flow chart for where empty or full bottles should go, what sections you should follow. And then it also has like warnings on it as well. Um, and we also wanna, we've been work developing training videos. The training videos would have like three different sections. The first section would be like an introduction this is what we're there where we're at so far. The first section would have like an introduction of the hazards that are associated with these solvents. The second section would have all the all the ideas we've been working on, and just introducing the employees to these ideas, and like the ideas for the better disposal options, and then um, solvent usage while they're using the chemical as well. We just want to provide like training reminders. Because what we found is that um, due to COVID or other other reasons, for some reason, um, the newer employees weren't being properly trained on their solvent usage. So we, we'd like to address that with these training videos and just make it easier for them to be able to figure out what to do with those empty bottles. And then we were, we're also looking at enhancing communication between the managers and the employees. Um, the first level managers, they are, what we've learned is that the first level managers are often the first line of communication for um, these employees because some of these employees don't have email. So the only way that they hear about stuff is through their managers. So um, getting, providing like enough resources for the managers to be able to um, educate their employees properly, like before they start their shifts for the day. It would be a great way to remind them of um, proper solvent um, uses. And then we also want to get a video testimony from the bottle op operators. Um, bottle, op bottle operator is like the person that goes around and is in charge of um, picking up the empty bottles. We want to get like an employee perspective um, of what happens to the bottles and how much time they spend dumping them out and how easier, how much easier it would be for them and their job if they return the bottles correctly. And then these are some of the costs that are associated with the return waste and using a 2019 baseline. Um, determining how much this could be reduced by was a little difficult. Um, we talked to um, the fuselage integration manager and she's been there a while and she knows how her employees think and we just use one of her estimates for how much she thought that their um, return waste could be reduced by. So these are some of the savings using her estimate that we were able to calculate about $15,000 um, annually during a typical production year, three and a half tons of VOCs, 0.8 tons of HAPS and about a thousand gallons of hazardous waste could be reduced. And then the last project I've been looking at um, was the fuselage 
just, I, specific, I specifically looked at fuselage integration, this project, because it's the highest solvent user in plant two. And what we did was we did a dumpster dive on the two highest hazardous waste pickup locations in plant two. I don't know why my photos aren't working correctly, but the photo on the left showed a lot of the sealant that was being thrown away. And you can see on the right, these are like all the solvent rags that were being thrown away. And well, um, there's, a, there's a real little red circle right here where you can see, and you can also see the light green. Those are earbuds that employees are using. And they soak the earbuds in an IPA water solution and they're using it to clip, to remove like excess sealant from the fuselage. And when they're letting it soak in the solution, they're leaving the containers open to the atmosphere. And that's causing a fire safety issue due to the isopropyl alcohol evaporating quickly. I think, I apologize. I think that when I downloaded this, let's see the picture. So I can pull it up on the screen for right now so you can come back. Okay, this is, yeah. And I know I go through your, your presentation. So any questions for Caden while I do this? I, I'm sorry to have to do this, but I think it's better. Would you agree? Okay, we're gonna, we're just gonna, um, I'm gonna get to that. Oh, but yes, no, we're looking okay. at it. Gotcha. So tell us though, because when you have hazardous waste and you're going to reduce that, um, you're also reducing hazardous material or you're really reducing hazardous material, right? So then um, I'm not good at doing two things at once, you can tell. And so um, you reduce that hazardous material, you don't have the hazardous waste either. So do your numbers include both hazardous material and then the avoided hazardous waste, or do they just include the avoided hazardous waste? It includes both, like the raw material savings as well as the hazardous waste cost reduction. Okay, thank you. Now, do we have the right thing for you, Jacob? Yeah. Oh, not sure. Or you're one in the no notes section. So we're doing that. Okay. All right. So now I need to share it because I don't think I did do that, did I? No, I gotta zoom. Sorry, guys. So read the question. So the, the question was, what's the biggest barrier we face so far in these projects? Um, probably just like the slow and deliberate speed that the aircraft industry moves at. Um, it takes a long time to get these solutions and to like actually research them and determine their applicability to assess whether they were gonna cause problems or not, so. And it makes sense because if they screw up, then there will be a high risk. What's that? We're good? Yeah. Okay. I have a bar. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize. That's my fault, you guys. I didn't know that. Oh, there's the photo I was trying to show earlier. That's what the master mix machine looks like. That's the machine that's in charge of refilling the bottles. So as you can see, they flow right to left five at a time. And this machine is pretty old. So we'd like to re replace that if possible. And so that's hopefully refilling the, what is this? 12 ounce 16 ounce, yeah. 16 ounce mm -hmm. 
Um, so this over this holding tank is connected to a 55 gallon drum that's used to fill those blocks. And then the excess goes back into a hazardous waste drum, yeah. In the so the overflow is going to the hazardous drum and then shipped out. It gets disposed of as hazardous waste, yeah. This overflow tray is what captures the overflow, and it also it's also um, what they dump the return waste into as well. So they're both in the same waste stream. We show that slide again with the cabins. Yeah. Oh, sorry. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So you can see the one on the left is the um, the one. We don't like where all the totes are stacked on top of each other and you can't tell which chemical is which. So we want to remove those totes and get proper shelving to be able to separate those chemicals accordingly and make it easier for employees to grab and return the full slash partially full bottles of as well. Do, do those totes come from their station, the employee's station? Or is this tote come from um, the master mix operator? Okay, so he he puts them there. They um, put them in the cabin like that. Yeah. And then employees will pull out of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This was the slide that was completely completely blank. Um, that's fine. The two graphs on the bottom show how um, the waste changed from year to year. From the two um, highest pickup locations we did, the first, the location on the left is for fuselage integration, which is where um, we've been starting like a ground zero for, from. And then the one on the right is for seal bay. Um, some of the solutions we were looking at is getting like a standardized container for earbuds. The container, what we found is that um, the container is also uncovered and it's also soaking in a lot more solvent than they actually need. So the containers we've been looking at are about 86% smaller than the ones they're currently using, and they have lids as well. And we just want to put together like a standardized container that employees would be able to pick up from their tool crew whenever they're doing sealant processes. And we've also been looking at replacing the earbuds themselves with the swabs. The swab is a foam tip, and it's got a polypropylene handle. And we've been going through some like cost analysis for that as well. And it's really, I think the last barrier we're looking at is like seeing which costs more the swabs or the earbuds and then getting employee input as well, seeing if it does as good of a job as the earbuds do. And then we've also been doing a sol working on a solvent guide the following guide is basically like a document that would be available at employees stations. And it would just have um, like training reminders for the employees when they're using the solvent, both when they're using the solvent and then after for the disposal process as well. And it would just have like references to um, the solvent cleaning spec. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to reference that or not but it would basically just tell you what the service is supposed to look like after you're done cleaning it. And it would especially be helpful for newer employees as well. And most recently we've been looking at a ripple cloth to actually replace the cheesecloth that they're using to apply the solvent. Um, it's been described as similar to a makeup remover and it can, it's especially useful in like detail work for the, um, much smaller and harder reach areas. Um, and the bottle vendor we talked to on Tuesday, he brought us some of the samples for the bottles. And then he also referenced a case study that he had been working in, working on at Spirit's Tulsa facility. And he noticed a 60% reduction in their solvent rag waste. So if we're able to do that here, there would be lots of room for um, savings. Okay. Fuselage integration solution estimates. These are um, reduction estimates for the solvent guide and then the earbud reduction as well. And this is confined to just one area, the fuselage integration, but there are so many other areas that would benefit from these ideas as well. But these are just 
potential reduction estimates for that one area that we've been studying. And that's the highest solvent user in plant two as well. So these are some of the overall savings from these projects using a 2019 baseline. Um, and this does not include the overflow reduction estimates. And it also is confined to just the fuselage integration estimates as well. Uh, about 19 tons per year of VOCs, four, six, four six tons per year of HAPS, about 5,300 tons of hazardous waste, and then at least $57,500 in savings. Um, this is the summary continued. So look at the two target solvents, BMS 11.7 and MPK. Um, the proposed ideas from both the 2021 intern and then this year, these reductions overall for the entire facility will reduce them by at least three and a half percent and two and a half percent for 11 zone and MP respectively. Um, when you look at just the solvent hand wipe cleaning process, those numbers jump to 10.3 percent and 7.9 percent respectively. And um, overall, the hand wipe cleaning process accounts for 13 and a half percent of EMS 11 7 usage at the Wichita location and 1.6% 1. for MPK usage. Overall experience review, pros, it's great to know that the work that I'm doing helps reduce um, the environmental footprint. Some of the uh, skills I learned slash enhanced were critical thinking, problem solving, data, data management, especially because of all the data we have for the facilities, it's incredible. And the communication, knowing who to contact, has been very helpful with my supervisor in Canada as well. Um, I got to meet with meet and work with great people at both Pollution Prevention Institute and Spirit, and then the Con, as I mentioned earlier, these projects will unfortunately take a while to implement due to um, the slow and deliberate speed that aircraft industry moves in. Any questions? Um, I think the guide is probably my favorite. Um, the solvent guide was cool because it felt like my own idea, you know, like all the other ideas were kind of building off um, Hannah's work from last year, but this one was kind of like my own thing that I got to work on and um oh there's another reason sorry so you're saying your favorite was not the dumpster dye no no that did not smell good <laughs> <laughs> it takes a few of them to get used to so just keep it <laughs> Yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> Good question for Caden. Um, I have a question. It looks like there's a question online, Jacob, kind of hiding on you and Allison. That no, it's just the chat. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. I was curious if you ever got an answer from the communications people at Spirit about what kind of percent change in behavior you would get out of the retraining. Did they have a, an idea? And I'm sorry if we talked about this tonight. Yeah. So we asked them about oh, the question was if we ever got a percent, um, a percentage of reduction from the training and like the other employee awareness we were working on um we asked them about it but they said they didn't feel comfortable in providing an estimate because it's so hard to estimate how changing employee behavior would impact um the waste that's currently being produced i do remember yeah reading that now uh and then and then so we'll try to get some numbers mm -hmm. uh that use for kind of the default mm -hmm. from our EPA folks on that, but I'm okay. thinking it's going to be close to at least 15%. So it is 
you know, which I think is pretty conservative. Okay. So, um, but every little bit, every little bit helps. Any other questions for Kitty then? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.